Hello, good morning and welcome to um, our DLP client webinar. This is the latest in a series of webinars we're doing on planning topics. Um, today we're going to focus on planning in the Cambridge uh, to Oxford, Oxford Cambridge arc, um, and we're going to look at some issues that um, are arising that we think are relevant for clients and for people to know about, and we'll touch on various different aspects. It's also an opportunity for me to introduce to you um, some, some members of the Bedford planning team, uh, and also um, some members of our um, sustainable development and delivery team. So um, I'll just introduce oh, a bit of housekeeping first. Um, we will be recording this um, webinar, so the slides will be available or the video will be available on our YouTube channel with a link there. We'll also um, send out the slides as well, so people will be able to review those and share those with colleagues. Just introduction then. I'll do. A, I'm going to do a quick introduction today on the overall context of the arc. So where we are now, um, what's happening with the spatial framework, uh, many of you will be aware of the latest government announcements on that. Um, I'm then gonna hand over to, to my colleague, Anna Mir, who's an Associate Director in our Sustainable Development and Delivery team, who will be focusing mainly on the transport aspects of the arc, giving you an update on the latest announcements and some thoughts in terms of where things are gonna go in terms of um, transport aspects of the arc. Um, We'll then hand over to Juliet Richardson, who is a, a, one of my new colleagues here in, in Bedford, who has joined us from Cambridge County Council. Uh, and Juliet's going to be focusing primarily on the, the shifting governance uh, in Cambridgeshire. So we've recently had the mayor elections and ca uh, county council elections. So she will be um, updating on what that means in terms of planning um, in the Cambridgeshire area. And then, uh, uh, lastly, we'll be handing over to Graham Free, who's another associate director here in Bedford, uh, and Graham's going to be focusing in a little bit more detail on um, some case studies of projects that we've done recently in Greenbelt locations uh, in and around the Ark. Um, obviously, a good chunk of the Ark is within the Greenbelt, um, so uh, we're going to be looking specifically at, at proposals for infilling uh, within within the villages. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll try and stick to. Um, 45 minutes, um, which gives us a bit of time at the end for questions and answers. Um, so if you if you do want to ask a question, uh, by all means, use the chat function. Um, we're, we're, we're not um, doing verbal questions on, on the presentation today, um, but by all means, ask us a question through the chat box and we'll, we'll try to do our best to answer those at the end. Obviously, if we can't answer those questions, we'll, we'll come back to you in writing uh, separately. So the Oxford to Cambridge Arc, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with now. It's been it's been part of the government rhetoric for now for a number of years. Um, things have started to gather pace a little bit in the last uh, 12 months or so, and it's now a key part of the government's agenda. Uh, and there was a commitment in the budget in 2020 to develop a spatial framework, um, which the first paper in that process uh, came out in um, February 2021. And, and um, that's been produced by the Oxford to Cambridge Arc um, group, uh, which is a part, part of government. They're actively recruiting at the moment to a number of posts within, um, within the government to, to deal specifically with um, the Oxford to Cambridge Arc. Now, the policy paper was very much a sort of starting point, setting out the key parameters of um, uh, the framework essentially for, for growth in the arc. Um, so it's very high level and talks about key principles that they're going to adhere to in, in developing the vision for the arc and the, and, the, and the planning documentation for the arc. Three key objectives really to mention in that. Um, and those are focused around firstly, environment, um, improving the air quality, managing flood risk and enhancing biodiversity and the access to that biodiversity across across the arc obviously flooding is a big issue particularly in um, the eastern part of the arc sort of cambridge around the ouse valley um, in, into bedford as well um, and that's something that the arc wants to address connectivity is is obviously key as well um, we're going to come on to um, east west rail uh, in anna's presentation today and also there's been um, reference to a, a road connection through the expressway so that's a key component of um, connecting the arc to deliver development. Um, so transport corridors is, is essential. And then finally, um, the third aim is to improve affordability of housing. Now that, that, that 
is in a number of ways and, and the detail on that is still very light but um, essentially it's about delivering more homes um, to, to boost supply um, in, a, in an area of high demand and high house prices. So that's that's the three three key aims of the, of the arc which I'm sure most people are familiar with. Um, the, the key interesting point really is that the um, spatial framework when it's adopted and I'll come on to the timetable for its production now but when it's adopted, it will sit alongside the MPPF. So it will essentially become a na national policy statement. Um, so it will, will be material in, in making planning decisions um, and it will have a status um, similar to the MPPF when, when adopted. In terms of a bit more detail here, so the, the key objective of, of, of the ARC is to, to enable sustainable transport-led development. So there's a key focus on transport and that's something that Anna will touch on more in her presentation. There's talk about new settlements. Uh, we already know that some authorities on the route are, are planning for new settlements already. Um, habitat recovery, uh, delivery of local nature recovery strategies and green space obviously is a key, one of the key objectives. Focus on brownfield, um, densification of urban areas, but also expanding settlements um, and uh, enhanced access to sustainable transport modes. So. Yes, it's, it's about sort of expanding existing settlements, but there's also opportunities for new settlements. And it's important to state at this stage that the ARC is going to be very much a strategic um, framework. So um, it probably won't look much below new settlement level. Um, it's, it's certainly not going to be allocating smaller sites. That's certainly for the, the local authorities themselves to do, but it's looking at strategic level growth. And then housing needs um, to be met in full, including de delivery of ho affordable housing. Um, obviously, big debate about uh, house, housing needs. Um, so that that will be interesting to see how that in, um, sort of rolls out as the spatial framework is delivered. Just then, in terms of timetabling, um, the the launch was obviously in February this year. So um, so that's that's the document I've sort of picked up on here. They're engaging at the moment with with local partners and the public. Um, we're expecting summer this year the vision document uh, for the framework to be produced alongside with some uh, alongside some of the evidence base. So there'll be some consultation on that to look out for later this summer. Um, next spring, there will be further publication uh, and consultation um, on the, ne the next stage. I mean, it's, it's a very iterative process, as you can tell. So there's going to be lots of consultation, lots of engagement, um, primarily because there's lots of interested parties in, in what is a big area. Um, Further option testing then, um, this time next year through to autumn 2022, consideration of responses. And then finally, the important date really is, is that the draft um, spatial framework and evidence base will be published in full in autumn 2022. So not really that far away. We're talking sort of 18 months maximum, assuming it all goes to plan. Um, and then publication implementation, is, <sighs> haven't given a date for at this stage but um i guess that will, will will depend on you know how controversial the proposals are and and the need to get the stakeholders on board so i think we're probably looking at 2023 and beyond um for for an adopted um spatial framework covering covering the arc so so that's a very very brief overview of um the arc and where we are at the moment in terms of the um the spatial framework what, what we're going to do now is just focus on some of the key aspects of that um, and, and I'll hand over to my colleague Anna Mir who's going to talk through some of the transport uh, implications. Thanks for that Andy, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, my name's Anna Mir, I'm an Associate Director here at DLP. Um, I actually sit within the Oh, just look at my slides aren't moving. Yeah, I actually sit within the sustainable development and delivery team. Um, and I'm here briefly to discuss the transport related issues associated with the Oxford to Cambridgeshire Arc. So yeah, I thought it'd be useful to give a slight introduction at first as to who the sustainable development and delivery team are. Um, we're actually part of DLP planning, which I think a, a few people aren't maybe aware of. Um, we've got offices in Bristol, Sheffield and East Midlands, where our sustainable development and delivery team sit within the DLP offices there. So we work together um, and we provide support 
to the planning team and other clients in terms of planning applications, land promotion, um, and strategic development sites coming forward. My main work is the transport planning side where we look at anything from the site access appraisal to feasibility studies, transport assessments, travel plans to support applications. Then the other areas of work are sort of listed there that our team cover. So that's FRAs, drainage, master planning, GIS and sustainability mapping. So again, just to give, it might be useful to give you a sort of idea of the work that the sustainable development and delivery team are involved in. Um, the first one being the site um, that we worked on behalf of the NHS for a site in York. Um, this was a proposed change of use scheme um, from an existing office building to a new mental health care hub. Um, we prepared the supporting documents for the planning application in terms of the transport statement and the travel plan. I've jumped ahead there. There we go, we're back. Um, so yeah, the key issue for York City Council was the impact of the scheme on parking. There wasn't a lot of parking provided at the existing office building, and there was concern in terms of patients and staff that there'd be an impact on the surrounding road network. So we provided evidence in terms of parking demand assessments, staff surveys, and what have you, um, to determine how much capacity there was on the surrounding roads, and eventually, reaching an agreed position with highways that the amount of overspill parking would actually be acceptable. Um, and that gained planning consent in November last year. Another recent example, perhaps more local to this presentation is um, a recent appeal success that we had in the S sustainable development delivery team working with our planning colleagues. Um, this was a small scheme of five dwellings um, and it was refused in May, 2020 on several grounds but in relation to highways specifically, um, they were concerned with the substandard access that was to be utilized. And a common issue that we come across is allowing for refuse collections and local authority refuse vehicles to enter the site, whereby we stated that a private management company would be employed um, and that it, the site could be serviced by private refuse collections. The appeal was late 2020 um, and we put forward our arguments and the appeal was actually allowed in March 2021. Um, so a recent scheme and yeah, just a sort of example of again, the work that we do here. So focusing on the Oxford Cambridge Arc, um, the first scheme that I briefly wanted to touch on is the Oxford to Cambridge Expressway, albeit it was announced March this year. Um, the Department for Transport have abandoned the scheme. Um, the scheme would have actually allowed for minimum dual carriageway road up to a three lane motorway in places, um, linking the two cities. Um, and it would effectively be another link between the M4 and the M1. The project was designed to support, support urban development and there were proposed million houses um, to be implemented as part of the scheme. I think Oxford, Oxford share was to be over 300,000 homes. Um, and in Cambridge, the proposal was to add another 270,000 homes. However, ultimately, Department for Transport scrapped the plans, as I say, in March this year, stating that, albeit 28 million pounds had been spent to develop the scheme, um, that it was just not a cost-effective solution after weighing up the options. So this slide gives, um, the potential route that the expressway would have taken. I appreciate it might be difficult to see this on your screens, um, but I think as Andy said, all the slides will be available after the presentation is circulated. So given the expressway has recently been canceled, what's the next plan in terms of improving transport and connection links? Um, the government continues to work with Highways England um, to identify more localised schemes within the Oxford Cambridgeshire arc. Um, the Department of Transport have set out that, that there is a need for more localised and targeted um, transport investment. One scheme that is still progressing is the East Well Ring, East West Rail Link, which I think Andy's briefly touched on, um, and that's still progressing. So we're going to look at that in slightly more detail now. 
So why the need for this link? Um, there is a historic concern regarding poor rail service connections um, with East Anglia and onward links to London. There's a strong desire to link communities to job opportunities and provide access to new homes, connections to science parks, universities and industries. It is envisaged that unlike the expressway scheme that's scrapped, um, the Oxford Cambridge rail link would obviously offer a sustainable form of transport, reducing car usage um, and then encouraging that modal shift. So again, if you're not able to see this, we will be circulating links, um, but this shows the sort of scheme and overview um, and the link between Oxford and Cambridge um, and how the plan is to help it make it easier for people to travel around the area, creating more opportunities and providing social and economic benefits. Um, the aim being to inject an estimated 1.1 billion pounds into the local economy. So moving on in terms of the progress to date as to where we're at with the Oxford Cambridge rail link, um, the scheme is going to be delivered in several stages. The Oxford Bicester link was completed already in December 2016. The next stage one, um, construction is already underway from the Oxford to Milton Keynes link. Um, stage two coming forward is the Oxford to Bedford link. That's a detailed planning um, stage. And then the final connection is Bedford to Cambridge. And this is still at the early planning stage. Um, and this will complete the full link to Cambridge. Each section of the route is actually delivered as a connection stage, which relates to a full journey, not just a piece of track meaning services are reliable between those points from the beginning and provide value for money. Um, with each stage brings new services, um, stations and journeys for people. The most recent consultation um, actually ended a couple of days ago, 9th of June, um, which allowed members to, of the public to share views on the developing plan. So drilling down again specifically to the Bedford Cambridge link of the scheme, Unlike other sections of the East to West Rail Link, this Bedford to Cambridge link will follow a completely new route. An initial public consultation exercise was held early 2019. And as a result of that, a preferred route has been identified. Um, Travelling from Bedford to Cambridge via North Sandy, South Neats and Camborne. And that preferred route was announced January 2020. So the introduction of the East West Rail services means that existing infrastructure needs a range of improvements to make sure sufficient capacity is available for trains to be punctual and ensure a standard of customer service is achieved. So as part of this link, there's a new station proposed um, in the Camborne area, another new station in the Sandy St. Neots area. And as part of the scheme, the Bedford station is to be rebuilt or modified to allow for the additional services. So again, you might not be able to see this clearly, but we can circle at the end, um, and it, but it just provides context in relation to the route of the Bedford Cambridge section and the likely potential of the new stations and the modified Bedford station. The key benefits of this section being it provides easier access to Bedford Town Centre and supports plans to regenerate the area. Um, enables onward connections across the Midlands and provides a simplified access to Cambridge city centre and then onward connections, as mentioned earlier, across East Anglia and Norfolk. So in terms of the route to construction of the Bedford to Cambridge link, um, as outlined earlier briefly, um, the exact route of this preferred option is still being decided with factors such as avoiding adverse effects on the environment and wildlife still being taken into consideration. The East West Rail Company is currently contacting landowners in the area around the preferred route in order to arrange access to undertake environmental surveys and assess issues such as flood risk and drainage. Once the final route is selected, the East West Rail Company will submit their proposals to the Secretary of State for Transport as part of an application for a development consent order. The planning inspector will then carry out a public examination of the proposals on behalf of the Secretary of State for Transport, which takes up to about six months. The inspectorate conducts a series of examinations and hearings, um, taking into account public comments on the application before submitting their recommendation. 
The final decision by the Secretary of State is given within approximately six months at the end of the examination process. Once any initial um, conditions are dealt with, the government will then consider the full business case of the project and make a final decision to proceed and then can commence with the construction. So tying it all together in terms of um, planning terms, um, what does this all mean basically? Whilst the Oxford Cambridge Expressway scheme has been cancelled, there is localised schemes such as the Black Cat Roundabout to Caxton Gibbet Roundabout upgrade scheme that's still progressing, and such schemes will support long term growth in the region. Improved rail road and rail links across the arc are designed to unlock areas of countryside for further development. And the construction of the East West Rail is like to involve major housing developments, especially near to the location of the new East West Rail stations. So overall, in terms of planning terms, the focus would be upon identifying suitable locations which could be developed going forward, which would then tie into these planned infrastructure improvements. That's it from me. I think Andy's mentioned um, that there'll be an opportunity to ask questions, but now I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Juliet Richardson in the Bedford office, who is going to discuss governance in Cambridgeshire and what this means for planning. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Juliet Richardson. I'm uh, an Associate Director at uh, DLP planning. Um, I've recently joined DLP from Cambridgeshire County Council, where I manage the um, strategic planning and transport assessment team, um, working a lot on the strategic sites and the growth areas in Cambridgeshire, um, and uh, did a lot of Section 106 work, and were the statutory consultee uh, team for Cambridgeshire. So that's sort of where I've come from and my, and my, my background. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the governance in Cambridgeshire, which is particularly unusual. So the first thing to say is that Cambridgeshire and Peterborough since 2017 have had a mayoral authority. Uh, so the mayoral authority is similar to what is in London and other metropolitan areas where it is a overseeing authority um, that has a particular um, governance and authority over health and transport and some land use planning matters. So the mayoral combined authority as it's known is uh, quite a small team that uses resource from its partner organizations um, to achieve its, its policies and its goals. So I've just put a slide up which shows the structure um, of Cambridgeshire governance at present with the mayoral combined authority uh, working with its partner organisations, the County Council and Peterborough City Council, which is a, a unitary authority. There's also the five districts of Cambridge City and South Cambridgeshire, which are merging into a Greater Cambridge Planning Authority. Um, they're moment there's two separate organisations but I'm sure in due course uh, are combining some of their their resource. Huntingdonshire District Council, East Cambridgeshire and Fenland and then you might also notice there's an extra slide uh, that I've put in between Greater the Greater Cambridge Partnership between the County Council and Peterborough City. Now the Greater Cambridge Partnership is uh, a particular team which uh, looks at enabling skills and connectivity and infrastructure around the Cambridge sub-region. And that was, uh, came out of the city deal proposals that were consented several years ago and is funded by central government. Its funding is dependent, however, on actually achieving um, and delivering really quite specific pieces of infrastructure and goals. So uh, that's the sort of governance. The only other um, uh, organisations I think that we need to mention in terms of this influencing structure are the LEP, which is the um, Local Economy Board, and also um, the University of Cambridge, which is a significant uh, employer, landowner and influencer in the Cambridge subregion. So in terms of local plans, at the moment, they're not particularly aligned. 
So Cambridge City and South Cambridgeshire are preparing uh, a greater Cambridge local plan. As I said earlier, they are obviously combining resource to look at the growth of, of Cambridge. Uh, the influence of obviously the Cambridge City goes beyond its boundaries, which is actually quite tightly drawn into the district of South Cambridgeshire, which absorbs quite a lot of the Cambridge City housing and economic growth. They are currently reviewing their plan and they have just completed a call for site and are now going through um, a public consultation, formal public consultation towards the end of the year and uh, will be replacing the local plan that was adopted in October 2019. East Cambridgeshire have a plan which uh, also goes to 2031. They are not intending a full review at present, but what they have done is they have started a second review, but just on housing numbers. Fenland, they have a, a plan to 2031 and they are reviewing that, but it's at a very early stage and I think um, the disruption to COVID has certainly uh, made them rethink when they're putting out their consultation, but that is hopefully going to start this year. And Huntingdonshire have a, a pretty much adopted local plan and they haven't yet published a review timetable. So the, the, uh, the area is well covered by local plans, but they're just not aligned and they're reviewing really in very different timescales. So what are the, the characteristics of Cambridgeshire? Well, uh, it's a very diverse area and it has a very strong economy dominated by Cambridge, obviously, and also Peterborough has its own very distinct economy as well. So they have um, a planning policy that's very focused around uh, spreading the investment from Cambridge uh, around the county. They have uh, quite a significant infrastructure deficit. There's quite substantial issues with um, accessing Cambridge in particular and connectivity and getting into Cambridge. There's also issues with water management. We're a particularly dry area of the country here. And uh, certainly with the statutory authorities, there's um, a lot of work going on to invest in water management and potentially the proposition of new infrastructure to make sure that the, the area doesn't run out of water. Certainly with the South Cambridgeshire local plan and its issues and options early on in its review, water has been identified as, as a really significant issue that needs to be resolved through the local plan. Housing is also an issue because it is such a diverse county, the pressure for development is quite different across the county. Uh, as you go from Cambridge North, the pressure for housing decreases and also the house prices do decrease um, quite substantially. Uh, it also means that there's a pressure on affordable housing. So there's um, certainly in Cambridge quite long housing waiting lists and the, the political pressure as well to, to uh, provide affordable housing to policy compliance standards is particularly strong. So the disparity across the county we have in, in investment and skills, we have in land prices, development pressure and also housing delivery. Cambridge has historically delivered quite strong housing growth, it has quite high land prices, the development pressure is strong and it obviously has a lot of um, investment in uh, infrastructure and skills and as you go north it gets much harder to achieve quite the same uh, commitment to infrastructure and skills and accessibility. So in May 2021 there hadn't been elections for a couple of years because of Covid so uh, it was pretty much all out. All the county councils up for election, the mayoral change was up for election, and there were some, also some smaller council elections across the district. But I think the most fundamental change was that the mayoral uh, seat changed. It went from James Palmer, who was a Conservative, to Dr Nick Johnson, who was Labour. Uh, and the county council changed from a Conservative control council to a coalition that is independent and Labour and Lib Dem. So this makes quite a substantial change. We don't yet, I don't, I don't think we quite know yet what the new mayor, the direction he's likely to take, but already he's indicated that some of the policies to provide what we would know as the CAM, which was an underground transport system, has been, um, has been dropped. He's looking at seeing what work and what studies can be 
reused and recycled, but he has very much indicated that he will be focusing on public transport and the use of buses, whether or not that's the use of guided buses again, as we have from Cambridge up to St Ives or have to wait and see. Um, but certainly it is about getting uh, access into Cambridge from the surrounding market towns, which would be um, uh, St Ives and St Neart and Camborne um, into the Cambridge sub-region. And also he has indicated as well that uh, the affordable homes agenda is particularly going to be strong and also employment support and skills so that the very high employment skill base in Cambridge can be met and that also uh, deprivation gaps that are quite apparent even though it's a very affluent area or obviously uh, they can be quite apparent um, around Cambridgeshire and ensuring that those skills gaps and employment support is, is very much met. Um, one policy I think that is being continued and was a great success of the previous mayoral authority was the establishment of uh, Anglo Ruskin University in Peterborough and that will be continued. So the county council uh, lost the Conservative lost control, it's now controlled by a, an alliance with independents. Uh, I think at the moment the indications are that there'll be continued emphasis on economic growth and there will be potentially more emphasis on sustainable decisions and the climate emergency. And there will also need to be solutions for the care of vulnerable adults. Uh, the large portion of the County Council budget goes on care for uh, vulnerable adults. And what I think the County Council will be keen to do is to ensure that the care can be met in uh, a number of ways that is uh, certainly more affordable and um, is, is more deliverable rather than um, relying on um, adjoining authorities. So I hinted earlier about the Greater Cambridge Partnership. It's a, it's a very important body in, in Cambridgeshire. Um, it is a local delivery body, but it does bring power and investment. It's up to 500 million over 15 years and it is uh, going to bring vital improvements to infrastructure and supporting acceleration of jobs and homes and apprenticeships. The board of the GCP or the Greater Cambridge Partnership have four partners and they all have equal voting rights. So it's Cambridgeshire County Council, South Cambridgeshire Council, Cambridge City and the University. Again, the political uh, persuasion has changed in that. Uh, it used to be uh, quite substantially conservative in control and now that has changed. So again, uh, I think hopefully because uh, we do have a more aligned political control with the mayor and the county and South Cambridgeshire that potentially we might be looking at faster delivery of infrastructure. And I'm thinking particularly of the Cambridge to Camborne scheme known as the C2C, which will release homes at the Bourne Airfield development. So I think that's certainly one advantage of the recent political changes. Just to say as well that this week we were notified or we it came to our attention that there were electoral boundary changes proposed in Cambridgeshire. Uh, the proposals would increase the number of MP seats from seven to eight and there'll be a new constituency in St Neots. All but one of the seven Cambridgeshire constituencies would remain the same but their boundaries will change as a result. So this is really to rebalance constituencies based on population size. So what are the planning implications of these changes? Uh, very early days, but I think early indications are that the uh, political alignment will be pro-development. It will want to continue the economic success. It will want to spread those economic benefits and those skills benefits to beyond its current boundaries, but it has to be sustainable. Uh, political, there is political concern over strategic site delivery and infrastructure. A lot of Cambridgeshire's growth is focused on delivering large sites, which are inherently high risk um, and bring uh, their own set of issues, particularly with delivering and the alignment of infrastructure. There are, it's a, it's a complicated and a busy picture of delivery. We've got multiple agencies bringing investment as well, such as Network Rail, which my colleague Anna has just alluded to, but we also have people like Homes England and we've got the, Oxford, the Cambridge Oxford Arc, obviously, which is 
uh, looking at what infrastructure needs to be included to promote growth. There's progress made on the skills for AIU and Peterborough. And we need to ensure that uh, the, the area is, is connected well and the, the, tr the transport hubs work well in, in making sure that people can travel around sustainably um, in, in a, a convenient and a efficient way. Affordable housing delivery has been slow, largely because there has been a dependency on strategic sites and obviously with viability and cash flows, uh, it is the market housing that developers want to push forward first. So there's certainly a question mark on how we get the affordable housing moving uh, in advance or with the market housing. So there may well be an increased focus on delivery of small sites um, in Cambridgeshire. Potentially faster decision making as well with political alignment, uh, certainly across Cambridgeshire. The north of Cambridgeshire does remain uh, largely at both local and strategic level in a conservative control. The development pressure there is lower, but the viability is also lower. Um, and they have relied less on strategic sites. Uh, so this change really very much affects the uh, greater Cambridge area. But I think what we are looking at is potentially a shift to delivery of smaller sites with a, a particular emphasis on sustainability. So just to mention, I won't uh, dwell too much on this, but um, there is a change in how local housing need is being delivered. So housing need is, is essentially an unconstrained assessment of the number of houses needed in an area. And the government released the new 2020 standard method for local housing need, which they consulted on. Um, and the upshot of this was that effectively it uh, required the delivery of more housing in areas of greater development pressure. So I've just put a table there which um, highlights the um, uplift of housing that was required in Cambridgeshire and how that broke down over the districts. So you can see that Cam Cam South Cambridgeshire, for example, had an uplift, um, whereas uh, Fenland had a slight decrease. So that's just something worth keeping an eye on because it's something that we can definitely uh, uh, use as a leverage to, to enable um, more favourable considerations, particularly on the smaller sites. So going forward, the new political landscape remains under construction. We're certainly hoping for faster, more coordinated infrastructure delivery for the Cambridge subregion. We're expecting the continued rise of affordable housing up the political agenda, but that's also being supported by central government in that the, um, the mayoral authority has a fund for assisting with the delivery of affordable housing on sites which are um, struggling with viability to deliver that. We have an increased emphasis on climate change and sustainability. And also there is a constant challenge of five-year housing supply sites uh, across the county. Um, and that is also uh, emphasised by the delivery of strategic sites. So uh, if, if strategic sites are stalling, then there will be a uh, pressure on districts to release much more smaller, much more infill sites. And then just to keep an eye on the local plan reviews across the county, particularly the city and South Cams will be interesting as that goes forward. And then uh, Fenland and East Cams at much earlier stages and doing single issue reviews on consultation. So that completes my presentation. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. And I'm going to pass to my colleague, Graham, who is going to give you um, in filling in villages and green belt. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Julia. Um, my name is Graham Free. Um, I'm one of the associate directors um, based here in the Bedford office. 
and I'm going to be talking about um, development in the green belt with a particular focus on um, in limited infilling. So just in terms of the policy context, um, national policy um, can be found within the framework and um, paragraph 145 is um, the pertinent part of it and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, criterion E um, in particular makes an allowance for limited infilling in villages. The wording allows for a certain level of interpretation and the key parts of it are not defined. Um, for example, what is meant by the term limited and how do you assess if a site is within a village? Inevitably, it's then been left to appeal decisions and court judgments to provide a degree of clarity on the approach to um, greenbelt infilling. There are um, a number of um, court judgments, um, in particular the Wood case, which is the most um, frequently quoted. Um, and paragraph 12 of that judgment says that what constitutes um, appropriate infill development is not exclusively determined by an existing development plan, allocation or boundary, but rather it's a matter of planning judgment based upon the position of the site on the ground and on the site's context and relationship with the existing built development. Quite often, um, local planning authorities might try and assess whether a site is within a village using settlement boundaries, um, but this judgment makes it clear that it's about the site's relationship with existing built form that is important. Another um, important case, which you may be familiar with, is that of Lee Valley. And this judgment um, makes it clear that where development is found not to be inappropriate, such as infilling, it should not be regarded as being harmful to either openness or the purposes of including land within a green belt. It's often quoted by inspectors in appeal decisions and um, actually it makes quite a lot of sense because if openness were a consideration then that would undermine the principle of infilling a gap and in many cases this may prevent development from coming forward. I'm going to talk about um, a couple of case studies now and this is the first one. Um, it's a site in Aspie guys that um, DLP have worked on and um, we were successful um, on appeal. The site um, is shown, it's, it's outlined in red on the slide. It's an undeveloped piece of land, but it has a frontage with Mount Pleasant and um, it's contained by existing residential development to the north and to the south. Ashby Guys itself um, is washed over by the green belt, but it does have a green belt infill boundary. Whilst the site is outside of that, the infill boundary runs fairly close to it um, along the frontage of the site along Mount Pleasant. Um, however, um, as, as, we, as we know from the court judgment of Wood, um, settlement boundaries aren't determinative, so you have to look at the position of the site on the ground. And in this case, um, it's clearly well related to existing built development around it and can reasonably be said to be part of a village. So for the purposes of the tests at 145 of the framework, it can be uh, said to be a limited infill site. So the site itself, the application itself was submitted in outline um, for two dwellings with all matters reserved except for access, um, although an indicative layout plan, which is shown on the slide, was submitted with it. The council refused the application because, in their view, the proposal was not infilling. And the reasons that they gave were because the eastern boundary um, to the site joins open countryside and isn't contained by existing development. The plot width, in their view, um, was substantial and the site was outside of the Greenbelt infill boundary for Aspie Guys. So the council's view was it wouldn't constitute infill development and would be inappropriate development. It's an example of where councils have tried to use a development plan boundary to assess whether the site is part of a village and also um, consider the width of the plot as well. But there's nothing in the framework to suggest that a site has to be a particular size. The council also alleged um, there would be harm to openness, but as per the Lee Valley judgment, if it's found to be not an appropriate development, then this is not a consideration. So the client went to um, appeal on it. 
and the appeal was allowed and planning permission was granted. The inspector referred to the Woods judgment in his um, decision letter and found that the site was within a village given its proximity to existing development. And he also found that since the proposal would be for two dwellings, it would be limited. The inspector also found that um, despite the size of the gap and that the site was not enclosed by development on all sides, the proposal was small scale and would reflect the surrounding pattern of development and therefore fell within the definition of infilling in the framework. The inspector also noted that having found it would be a limited infilling in, in, in a village, a consideration of openness was not necessary. So the, the appeal decision for this site um, was a good example of a nice, simple, straightforward inspector's appeal decision, purely looking at um, the principle of um, development in the green belt. This um, is another um, green belt infill site that um, DLP worked on. Um, it's a scheme in St Albans. Um, the site's outlined in red um, on the slide, and it's contained by um, a development of flats to the north and a residential property to the south, and there's the River Ver um, to the rear as well. But as with the Aspley Guy site, it does have a fairly wide frontage um, to Frogmore Road. Just sitting to the north of the site is the village of Park Street, Frogmore, which has a defined settlement boundary. The site is outside of the defined settlement boundary, so it was washed over by the green belt. And a very small part of it, just limited to the frontage hedgerow, is within a conservation area as well. The site itself um, was formerly part of the Frogmore Garage site, um, which was a commercial business which operated to the north before it was de developed for housing. And the site was used as a car park in association with that commercial garage. So similar to the Aspie Guy site, it sits within a built up frontage, it's well related to the um, existing built development and can be said to be a contained site. So an outline application was submitted for two dwellings, all matters reserved except for layout and access. The council refused the application because they said it would not constitute limited infilling in a village. And the reason for this was um, because the, the, the site was outside of the um, village envelope. So in their view, it wasn't within a village. The gap um, was substantial and there'd be harm to openness. So um, DLP also um, looking at the decision notice, advised the client to appeal the decision. The appeal was allowed and permission was granted. And again, the inspector made reference to the Wood case and found that the site notwithstanding the fact it was outside the settlement boundary, was part of the built-up area and so was within the village or part of the village. He also set found that it was a well-defined gap between built development, the residential flats to the north and the residential property to the south. And so again, this was a clear indicator that size is not determinative, but it's the characteristics and context of the site um, that are important and that two large plots on a spacious layout would be consistent with the pattern of development in the area. And again, the inspector also noted that there was no requirement to consider, to consider openness because the proposal would con constitute limited infilling um, in a village. However, there are times when inspectors reach different conclusions. There's, um, Goffs Oak is a, in Broxbourne is a scheme that um, DLP have been working on, which went to appeal and was dismissed. Whilst the inspector agreed that it was an infill site, the inspector found that 11 dwellings at depth um, would not be limited for the purposes of the framework. This was despite the fact that as part of the appeal case, we provided numerous examples of where inspectors had allowed appeals for a similar number of units um, in the green belt. However, we are now working with the council towards a, a more positive outcome on this site for a slightly revised scheme of fewer units. The other example um, is a site um, in the village of Tingrith, which was for one dwelling. Um, in this case, the inspector found that um, it wouldn't reflect the surrounding pattern of development because access would be taken from the south, from the high street. Um, rather than from St Nicholas to Close, which is where um, the existing properties took their access from. And also the size and orientation of the garden wouldn't reflect the existing pattern of development, so it would be at odds with existing development in the area. 
So the layout of a scheme and reflecting the pattern and character of the area is important when developing um, green belt infill sites. So what lessons um, have we learned from um, green belt infilling work? When considering whether a site's in a village, it's the relationship with existing built development that's important, not whether it's within a settlement boundary or, or a development plan boundary. The size of the gap is not necessarily determinative as, as has been highlighted by the cases in Frogmore, St Albans and um, Asprey Guys. In some cases, an outline application may be better than a full application and could improve the chances of success because the decision maker is only looking at the principle of the development and not the detailed design matters, albeit indicative layouts may be, may be submitted. As we've seen, the term limited is open to interpretation. So in the case of Goffs Oak, the inspector found that 11 dwellings would not be limited in the context of that site. Although there are decisions out there, um, appeal decisions in particular, where schemes for 11 or more dwellings have been found to be limited in, the con in, their, in that particular context. So the pattern of development in the area is important and that was highlighted by the um, Tingrith example. Thank you very much. And I will hand back to um, Andrew Parry for any questions. Thank you, Graham. And um, also thank you to Anna and Juliet for um, their presentations uh, as well. Um, we have finished with about five or six minutes uh, left before our scheduled finish time of 11 o'clock. So we've got a bit of time for questions and answers. Now, if I could just um, quickly ask for my colleagues to unmute themselves and, and share their videos and we'll, we'll, we'll um, start a bit of a, um, uh, a Q and A session. Um, I would say if anyone has any questions following on from the presentations, please do put them in the chat box. There should be a chat function that you can you can add to uh, as we go and we will try and pick up anything as, as it comes in. Um, we I mean, I, uh, I, I've got a few questions that we can we can sort of start the debate with uh, and hopefully get people thinking a bit. Um, um, and it, firstly, I think probably over to one for Anna. Um, in relation to East West Rail, and I mean, um, clearly, um, you know, a rail connection that goes east west is, is is needed. I think most people agree with that. I think um, I think it's it's sort of long overdue in some ways. Um, what are your thoughts on on how much it might encourage a modal shift away from the, using the car? I mean, because you, you talked about there, um, they're still proposing to go ahead with the A428 Caxton Gibbet to um, Black Cat improvements to improve connectivity between the west of Cambridgeshire and and Cambridge itself. Um, how much of an impact do you think East, East West Rail might have in terms of encouraging people to get out of the car and into trains? So yeah, I think the government does accept that more needs to be done in terms of promote, promoting sustainable travel um, in the area. I mean, I think in terms of car ownership and commuting, this sort of area is one of the worst in terms of modal split for, I think the UK average is about 60% car drivers commuting. And in this sort of area, it's up to like 67%. So I think there is a recognition that focus needs to be on the more sustainable travel. Obviously the East West Rail link is a strategic link, linking the two cities. But I think the focus also then needs to be at the end of those journeys and tying in economic growth, housing with perhaps that sort of last mile um, journey as well. So whilst you've got your strategic link, the East West Rail link, how's that then going to tie into, say, the guarded busway in Cambridgeshire and stuff um, and allowing people once they've undertaken their rail journey as part of a link journey, they then use the last mile as, you know, walking, cycling, public transport. Um, because I think, yeah, there is a recognition that, I know Juliet's alluded to in terms of the focus now is on sort of improving bus journeys and what have you and public transport. So, yeah, I think, I mean, in terms of the sustainability side, I think there are calls for the East West Rail Link to be fully electrified as well. I mean, there is the acknowledgement that we want to be going that way. So, yeah, I think it does open up. Yeah, I mean, from a personal point of view, as someone that lives in the western side of Cambridgeshire, I think... Um, settlements like St Neots, Huntingdon um, and, and Camborne as well and I think on your presentation you showed that the potential or the proposal yep, yeah. is for a new station at Camborne and that's 
Camborne, as, as Juliet will know, is a huge new new settlement and is proposed to expand um, significantly in the future. So I think, you know, having a, a rail link from Camborne into the centre of Cambridge is, is a huge uh, oh, benefit wow. uh, in terms of taking cars off that sort of last, as you say, the last mile into, yep. into Cambridge on the road network. And as we know, the road network in Cambridge particularly in Cambridge City itself, isn't designed to cope with huge amounts of, of traffic. So mm-hmm. the more we can encourage people to, to use rail uh, connectivity into the, town, into the city, the better, really. And I think, Julia, that, that, that just links to you, I think. There's a question I was going to pose to you about, to what extent do you think the East West Rail is going to benefit Cambridge as a, as a location, as opposed to the wider region. Do you, do you think it's likely to have the impact of bringing more people into Cambridge and Oxford as large centres of Milton Keynes as well? Uh, or do you think it's gonna shift the sort of growth patterns and development patterns away from these centres? I think it's both. I think it is about keeping the prosperity and the vitality of Cambridge and that investment in Cambridge. I think it is about um, information sharing. We've had the relocation of AstraZeneca headquarters into Cambridge and they will um, obviously want to continue their linkages with Oxford research establishments. But equally, you know, uh, Oxford and Cambridge and Milton Keynes are all dependent on people actually getting into these centres for leisure, for employment, for skills. So I think it is it's very much two way. Um, I think what we need to be focusing on is getting the big infrastructure right and then focusing on the last three miles of that, of that journey, both in terms of um, promoting economic growth and also getting people in and out of those centres in a, in a sustainable way. I think, I think a key challenge for the spatial framework as it as it's developed is going to be ensuring that they you know we don't just end up with a situation where everybody's commuting into Milton Keynes, Oxford and Cambridge. And it doesn't just it doesn't just make life easier for getting in into those places. And it's about making sure they don't become um sort of commuter settlements or oh, sorry, the, the likes of St. Neots and Huntingdon and uh, Bedford also don't just become commuter belt settlements for those larger um for those larger cities and it's about making sure there's investment in in jobs and um, retail facilities in the smaller towns as well to make sure that people are working and living in the same place and not not just commuting into the big cities Um, because I think at the moment that's in terms of road movements that's certainly what's happening in terms of people going to Milton Keynes Milton Keynes, Cambridge, Oxford are big honeypot locations, really, uh, encouraging people to use the roads that go into them. So that's a key challenge, I think, going, going forwards. Um, we haven't had any questions come through yet, so I'll continue continue with my uh, my pre-prepared question. Just looking at the Greenbelt um, in Phil Graham, obviously we've had, um, you and I have both had experience of, of infield proposals that um, have gone well and approved and others that have been refused. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on um, how local authorities are assessing it um, and whether there's a difference of approach between local authorities in your experience. Yeah, um, th- there can be um, a, a different difference of approach. If, if a local authority has a fairly detailed policy on um, infilling and sometimes supported text might set out how they would define an infill site and some of the older policies even contain numbers, um, then the local authority will um, more often than not follow that. Others um, will be a bit more um, pragmatic and a bit more flexible um, and follow the framework and in particular the the court judgments of uh, of Wood and uh, Lee Valley that I referred to. Um, So there there is a a bit of a difference. Um, I think the problem we found, haven't we, that is that every authority has a slightly different definition of what they consider infilling to be which isn't particularly helpful for for us or for you know the, the development industry um because you're having different discussions at, at pre and application stage in different authorities i think there may be a case for a national definition or certainly more more detail to sit behind criteria e of paragraph 145 i think um because as you say at the moment it's being largely interpreted by the court so probably one to to watch this space for in the in the um, in the new sort of planning bill and, and whether there's revisions to the MPPF in the future that may may look to, to sort of define that a bit more. It may yeah. be something to 
define in the glossary of the MPPF, for instance, you know, what, what, what does infill mean and what does limited mean? Um, but yeah. my worry, I think, is that, as you said in your presentation, that um, it's very much a case, case by case basis on what, in terms of planning judgment on what's on the ground. So, um, so still, still a lot, lot of question marks, really. That's, that's good. Um, just in terms of your advice, Graham, on greenfield sites, is there anything you, you would sort of advice you would give to clients about what they should look for when they're looking at um, purchasing infill sites or greenbelt sites? Um, I, I think that the key things are um, making sure it's it's contained on at least two sides um, with built built development, um, and that it has a frontage um, with, with the highway. So you can present an argument to say that it's a reasonably contained site. Um, and if it's not within you know, the village or built up area itself, then being reasonably well related to it on the edge. Um, so at least then you can say, well, it's reasonably part of that settlement you know, functionally and, and um, physically as well. Yeah. We just had a question come in on the chat from, um, from Graham Bloomfield, who formerly of this parish. Um, who's asked a question about uh, whether there's any examples of peel successes in more rural locations where gardens are defined as brownfield land. Um, and he's alluded to criteria G of paragraph 145, which is slightly different to what you what you've picked up on in your presentation, but still related. Um, that, that links to the definition of brownfield land. So it excludes private residential gardens in urban areas. Mm. But um, what Graham's alluding to there is obviously that in, in non-urban areas, so rural locations, gardens can be defined as brownfield land. Um, I'm sure we can dig out some examples for Graham uh, that we can send to him, but is there anything that springs to mind immediately? Um, nothing that springs to mind immediately, but I'm sure, as you say, we can dig out some examples. I think perhaps the difference between going through criterion E and being limited infilling and um, sort of a, a brownfield land um, is that you're then considering openness um, because there's the consideration of um, whether what you're, what's proposed is going to have a greater impact on openness yep. whereas that's not the consideration for infilling. So and and, and for those, way. sorry Graham, for those, for those that um, don't do, do this sort of development regularly, openness is, is sort of twofold, isn't it? It's the physical um, aspect of, of building on, a, on an open piece of land, but it's also the visual. So it's a, it, the courts have defined that it, it, it takes both forms. So you, you can't just say, because you can't see it, 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 it doesn't affect openness because it is also about the actual physical um, building and encroachment into otherwise undeveloped land. So um, yeah, we can, um, absolutely come back to Graham with some with some examples um, if we can find some that, that we can dig out for, for um, uh, brownfield back garden uh, under paragraph 145g. I'm conscious we we've um, gone over 11 o'clock but um, just just finally to to wrap up um, Juliet quick question for you about the mayor because I think the, the mayor issue in in Cambridgeshire is a really interesting one and is, is potentially quite significant for the area. Obviously, the, you know, we don't have a manifesto as such for the new mayor, um, so we're, we're a little bit in the dark as to what his, his sort of uh, objectives are, are going to be. But um, do you think, I mean, there seems to be already a shift away from large infrastructure projects. That was very much James Palmer's um, thing was big flagship infrastructure projects. Do you think the, the new mayor's got a slightly different emphasis? Essentially, I think we are all still waiting for um, early signs of where he's going to be heading. He has indicated that there will be um, a reuse of the evidence base that the previous mayor had, had set up. So he's very much looking at what he can reuse in evidence based terms. But I think certainly he is in transport terms looking at using public transport, public transport hubs. Um, potentially making the most of existing infrastructure um, and yes potentially actually saying whilst we do still need those big strategic sites they are how we deliver big numbers but actually you know the, the three C's he's working to are compassion cooperation and community would seem to suggest that perhaps he is moving away from the big strategic sites to perhaps more local developments more local smaller scales 
perhaps in some of our market towns and larger villages. Be interesting to see, but certainly his early approach has been something that is on a more um, uh, low, low key local scale rather than the big 10,000 homes, which certainly previous administrations have been pushing. It's early days, but I think certainly his three Cs are perhaps an early indication of that. Yeah, and I think to add to that, I think the other chain, big change is going to be the affordable housing um, aspect. So as James Palmer's initiative was what he termed the 100K home, um, and uh, I think it came out during the sort of mayoral um, uh, election sort of debate beforehand, before the elections, that I think he'd only delivered something like six um, 100k homes in his tenure as mayor so I think um, the new mayor has made it very clear he doesn't want to proceed with that that model anymore but I think we will definitely see um, a lot more emphasis going into delivering affordable housing through large-scale sites um, through you know through new planning permissions uh, and there may be a tightening up um, on that um, from his point of view it'd be interesting to see how he can influence that and what what, what powers he has to do that um, but we may see we may see a change in that in that regard. So I think it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, very much so. Thank you for that. Um, we haven't got any more questions come through, so I think it's a good point to to wrap up. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again to all the presenters today who put the made the time to put the presentations together and and um, uh, give them uh, to you today. Thank you for watching. Um, as I say, we will share the, um, the YouTube link so you can, uh, if you wish, rewatch um, the presentation or share it with colleagues who weren't able to attend. And we'll also circulate the, the hard copy, uh, sorry, the, the electronic copy of the slides so you can see the slides as well and share those. Um, if you have got any questions or anything has sparked any interest that you, you need some assistance with uh, sites you're looking at yourselves, by all means, drop us a line. I've put the general inquiries uh, email there. Uh, and that can then be filtered through to the relevant person within the team. We're always happy to discuss um, sites. We're always happy to give a view. Uh, we, we offer appraisals all the way through to the to submission of planning applications. So don't hesitate to drop us a line if, if you do want us to have a look at something for you and give a view. Um, and, and I think it just remains to be said that we are hoping to do more of these going forwards. I think we've got another one lined up. Um, I don't have an exact date for it yet, but it will be um, later on in the summer and that will focus more on uh, energy. Um, we, it's a growing market for us at the moment. So uh, if you're interested in, in renewable energy um, generation and, and how that sort of um, interacts with the planning system, um, we will be doing something on that later in the summer. So details will be circulated um, shortly on that and you'll have an opportunity to sign up um, uh, to that if you're, if you're interested. So um, thank you very much and um, have a good weekend and do stay in touch. Thanks, everyone.